Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Steph, what's going on? How you doing? I'm doing pretty, pretty good. Um, yesterday, I actually... Um, did something that I haven't done in a long time. I gave a workshop to a group of high school students. And so uh, that was that was really fun because I haven't been at the front of a classroom. It's particularly a classroom um, where the students aren't like my age or older in a very long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, adult student learners. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. How how was it? It was good. So I actually gave a presentation or the workshop uh, was about how they can use their story to inspire others. And so, you know, we often read stories on social media or we'll see videos on social media and what draws us in to actually you know, do something positive, whether it be vote or whether it be to donate something, it's sometimes those stories. So, you know, I worked with them to identify, you know, a story, a struggle, you know, something that they're going through and how can they weave that into like a social media campaign, a hashtag, um, a a longer story. And they had some really good ideas. So it was really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they should. Um, um, you know, they, I'm pretty sure they can work the social media a lot better than a lot of us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually. And the hashtag game and all that stuff. The, I'm uh, so not good at that. I, I gotta get better. Yeah, I'm sure that was, that was second nature to them. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. yeah. How fun. about you? No, I ain't yeah, been doing cool. much. Been doing much, getting my priorities in order for the rest of the summer. I know since we said that last year, you reminded me the summer's almost over. So yeah. I, uh, let me get some priorities in order and, and some work done. And so now that's all I've been doing. I'll probably start that this week, getting ready with classes and syllabi in order and all that amazing stuff. Fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have a... um a proposal for a conference is due tomorrow. Uh-huh. I could have spent all week doing it. I didn't. Uh-huh. I don't know why I wait till the last day. Uh-huh. Lord. Uh-huh. I so I got that due tomorrow. So I, I get what you're saying. Like, get, get my life together. Try to get it in order. That's funny. Oh, good luck to you on that proposal. I'm sure you'll get it in that time. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Well, we got some old Lord news for the week. I'm sure ready to rock. We we do. I got some interesting stories, man. Okay, right, yeah. All right, here we go. Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening old Lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say. Okay, so I have a question for you, Ty. Mm-hmm. Do you take Ubers or Lyfts or, or anything like that? Yep, I've you know I've taken my fair share of Ubers and Lyfts. Yeah, it's a, it's a really convenient way to travel, especially if you want to have fun, you want to drink, but you want to be safe. Well, be careful, y'all, because one Uber and Lyft driver in St. Louis, Missouri, has given more than 700 rides since March of this year. But what his passengers did not know is that he was live streaming them on his web show. <laughs> he, yes. So people's faces, sometimes their first names, their homes and their destinations were all on this live feed camera where people would comment and like, yeah, it, it's pretty bad. Yeah. And people mm-hmm. are literally just finding out months later that they have been streamed uh, from the like the news article because it was the people's information was so out there that like reporters were able to just use the videos to figure out who they were and contact them. Oh, wow. Wow. Where was this at? 
So this happened in St. Louis, okay. but actually he's not the only person that does this. Like he's one of the only drivers that doesn't tell people that they're going to be on this uh, web show that they know nothing about. You know, some Uber drivers or Lyft drivers will tell you like, I'm recording for this live show so that you have the option to get out or not. But mm. once he figured out that when he told people up front that he was recording them, a lot of them would decline the ride. So he just told, he decided not to tell them. Mm, 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 mm. That's crazy. Well, good. I mean, it's in St. Louis, so I was just qu- asking to make sure I, I didn't have to check to make sure I wasn't getting recorded on any of my rides. But that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it is something that you, you know, you might want to ask because, like I said, there are multiple like Uber or Lyft shows. Some drivers tell, some don't. So be careful, folks, because, you know, he has cameras on the inside and the outside. So if he's dropping you off at home, your address, like where you're going, like people can see these things. That's that's not safe. Yeah, he needs to. They definitely need to. Legally, there should be some kind of consent. You just can't be doing that. Um, Well, if you live in a one party state and you don't have to tell people if only one person needs to know, then what he's doing is technically legal. But it's mm, that is true. And I think Yeah, also because the way Uber operates too, hmm, because it is your own vehicle and like your own property and not, is it really the property of like the companies, you know, if you're doing that kind of stuff, it's weird. Um, So that's interesting. But yeah, nah, that's, that's not a good look. You don't want your information where you live and all that kind of stuff, especially if people have been partying or like maybe super drunk and Mm -hmm. not be their best, their best selves. (laughs) And he's recorded all of that, yes. I can only imagine yes. some of the things that have been captured in that live stream, so that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, so this is a funny and interesting story. I think you'll like this. Um, so Ty, in graduate school, Ty was a part of a basketball team. Zip them mm-hmm. up. You remember that? Zip them up. Zip them up. Yep, intramural league. Zip them up. <laughs> it was a league where they played basketball. And, like, when you play these games, you know, you're you're just on you're just giving it all on the court. You're not thinking about anything like if you guys get into it on the court, what's done on the court is left on the court. Mm-hmm. Well, not always. So there was uh some guys playing a pickup game at LA Fitness in Virginia. And a black guy, I guess, hard screened a white guy. Mm-hmm. Is that what you call it? Like he knocked yeah. him down. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't you know that this guy, when he got up off the ground, he gets up and he tells everyone that he's about to call the police and he walks out of the gym. Everybody is like, "Okay, he's joking. He literally walked out of the gym and called the police on this man for knocking him down in the basketball game. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. When does it end? When does it end? You know, when I heard that story, I was laughing so hard. I'm like, this is. I mean, it's so sad, but it's so funny to say. I'm like, this is ridiculous, man. Uh, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> and for those, I did think it was. Go ahead. Wait, no, you, no, you go. No, I was about to say for those of you I don't know, like a screen. All the dude did when somebody sets the screen, the one guy is just standing there, and then the other person runs into them. And so what happens? This guy ran into the guy standing there, and he ran into him pretty hard, and he fell to the ground. It wasn't like he like hit him or was going up for a shot and took out his legs. He literally just ran into the guy and he fell and he, I guess he was embarrassed or it might have hurt a little bit and he felt that was a hard <laughs> foul. Like, come on. Man. <laughs> Yo, that is so crazy. But I thought it was also crazy that they all just also ended up going back to the game and playing together again. But they were calling him a snitch and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, so yeah his reputation on that court. I mean, he's not going to be able to let that down for a while, I am sure. Especially the fact that it made the news like that and went viral. <laughs> <laughs> That was so silly. Oh, um, That's great. But speaking of speaking of viral, mm-hmm. our next story is I have two more because okay. I, I have to tell both of mm-hmm. these this week. Uh, so speaking of going viral, uh, some have you ever been texting like two people at the same time and maybe you send accidentally the text? text the yeah, text <laughs> the, send the wrong text? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so that happened. 
So there was, uh, it's college time. So people are getting meeting their roommates. So this black student at Georgia uh, Southern. So uh, this student email or text her uh, roommate to introduce herself, say, hey, how you doing? All of that stuff. Well, instead of replying back to her with the usual like, oh, how are you doing? She accidentally sent um, the black roommate a text that said that, oh, I checked out black roommates Instagram. It looks pretty normal, not too niggerish. (sighs) And then she immediately recognizes her mistake and was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. That damn spell check. I I meant to say she said she meant to say triggerish, as in, oh. <laughs> as in, as in she didn't see anything that triggered any red flags. Girl, oh, stop it. Man. Oh, man. oh my God. Yikes. No, no, they did not autocorrect triggerish to niggerish. <laughs> you meant it. <laughs> first off, first off, would autocorrect even spell that word out? Like, they would that's not. <laughs> Like that's such a lie. Oh my child. So I I don't know. Hopefully she can get um, a new set of roommates because we remember what happened to the other black girl who was being tormented by her roommate. The roommate was sticking the girl's toothbrush in her vagina and um, Mm. anal area and actually caused the girl to like have like a throat infection or something Mm, like that. So see, hopefully this person has a new roommate. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, trigger, autocorrect. My bad, autocorrect. Come on now. Now, I would say oh. that sometimes if you do use like certain words a lot, it may autocorrect it automatically as well. That still don't help her case out. You know, that's it in doesn't. Your, that's in your phone. It doesn't. Auto bank, autocorrect bank. <laughs> I, was, I was reading uh, some messages where people tried to see if their iPhone would I bet they potentially did. correct <laughs> triggerish to niggerish, and it never happened. Yeah, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Oh, be, yeah, one, stop being racist, and two, be careful who you being who you texting when you won't being racist. People, oh my god! Yeah, make sure you are in the right chat, honey. Okay, and so this last story, you know, it speaks to a topic that we are going to talk about today, which is justice, and it has me wondering whether justice will be served in this case. So. In Florida, uh, a few days ago, of course, Florida, Mm -hmm. um, there was a guy who went to like a convenience store with his either wife or girlfriend and child. The guy and his child, they go into the convenience store while the woman waits in the car. She happens to be waiting in a handicapped parking space. So uh, this white guy comes up to confront her about parking in a space. Um, I guess it gets kind of aggressive because someone comes into the store to tell the black guy, like, hey, you might want to go out there and, you know, handle this. So this is all on camera. The black guy, he comes out of the store. Um, you, There's no audio, but you see him use two hands to shove the white guy back. And it's a hard shove. The white guy um, falls to the ground. That's all the physical contact they have. Mm -hmm. While the white guy is on the ground, he immediately pulls out a gun and shoots the black guy in the chest. Oh, man. And and what is worrying me so much is that the sheriff's office have they've come out and and said things like this seems to be like a standard stand your ground case. Mm. And that's scary because this wasn't, there was no way this guy could have felt in danger for his life. After the guy pushed him, it's not like he goes in to start punching him. He shoves him, which of course, you know, yeah, maybe the guy can get up and try to fight mm-hmm. him or something like that. He shoves him, but it's not like the the black guy then like is about to start pummeling him. That's all that happens. He's just standing there after he shoves them. The guy pulls out the gun and shoots him. I'm sorry. Staying your ground should be you are in fear for your life. There was you can anybody can like go online and look at this video and see that other than the push, nothing else happens before he pulls out the gun to shoot. And it also pisses me off because we also know that Marissa Alexander was given 
20 years in Florida for firing a warning shot against her allegedly abusive husband. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it didn't apply to her. And that, I, Yeah. That's the, the way that people interpreting these laws, man, is a scary thing. Because even like that case you just talked about, like the Zimmerman case, right? It's like, it's, it's mm-hmm. like usually both parties play a role in that those kind of altercations. And it's like, mm-hmm. can you use it when, you know, like Zimmerman was chasing after Trayvon and all that kind of stuff and Trayvon had enough and came back and it was an altercation. But does that mean you were standing your ground? Like that's not standing your ground, man. It's like somebody's coming at you. And you're trying to protect yourself by any means. And it's life threatening. And I think they're using this life threatening thing a little too loosely. For sure. A little too loosely. I guess all you got to do is be a big black man. And oh, you fear for your life. Because that's what it seems like. Pretty much. Uh, And what's crazy is that the convenience store owner and other customers have come forward to say like this same guy has harassed them over the parking space. Yeah, you should not be parking in handicapped parking spaces. But you know what? There are laws about that and you get a fine mm -hmm. for it. Not death. You are not the police. You have no business confronting other people. You know, hell, y'all call the police for everything. Y'all call the police. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's the time you call the police. Like <laughs> somebody <laughs> in the handicap spot. I suppose that. Listen, people, that's the time you call the police and you get the authorities involved. Not when you get a hard foul. Oh not when a little girl God. selling water. You know what I'm saying? Not when somebody's mowing the lawn. That's the time you don't. But no, instead of those times, they want to shoot and kill people and take the law into their own hands. That's crazy. On hands. Yeah. So, you know, it's not the first time he's done that. He actually threatened another black guy who parked in that space, threatened to shoot him before. So, you know, hopefully justice is served. And this is not just kind of let go to say, well, our hands are tired, tied. Stand your ground. Because, no, nah, that's not standing your yeah, ground. We need to, we need to, they need to. They need to really probably just need to remove that law. Or make it a little bit way more specific. Maybe you got to yell out a couple of warnings before you shoot. Maybe you got to, you know, you just can't come out and just shoot and be like, okay, stand your ground. Because uh, cause if somebody's yeah. trying to, like, if you pull out the gun, even if it's like stand your ground, okay, I pull out my gun. I'm like, yo, I'm going to shoot and give you a couple of warnings. And then they still coming at me. And it's a different situation versus me just pulling it mm-hmm. out because I got embarrassed in front of people. And now I'm trying to use stand your ground. Mm-hmm. So hopefully... They can't use it in this case, and it works not in this guy's favor. But mm, I, I doubt it. Yeah. <sighs> well. But yes, yeah, speaking of justice, um, today's conversation is not about criminal justice. It's about community justice. But, you know, justice nonetheless. Uh, we are talking to Dr. David Harris, who's the executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute at the Harvard Law School. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, most of the, most of the people we've had on, uh, well, have been professors and some professionals as well. And, and so he's kind of a, a mix of the both. Um, you know, he does have his PhD, but works in a more, inst- well, he works in the Institute, which is a more professional setting, not really kind of like academia in the traditional sense, teaching classes, et cetera, but is using research to push forward certain policy agendas and, and making, you know, things justice justify justice whatever the yeah. case is in our communities and what's cool about it and we'll talk about in the interview as you'll see is that um they, they focus the, the institute focuses on many things uh many facets and dimensions of of social justice and community justice type of work and how to use research to promote these things and try to influence and put things into action so so it's a really good interview and i'm sure you guys will get a lot out of it for sure yes all right Is you ready to get into it all right yep let's go Catch up with y'all afterwards. Far too often, communities of color are left out of policy discussions and decisions that directly affect their livelihoods, opportunities, and well being. Today, we focus our discussion on how to bring justice to our communities with Dr. David Harris, Executive Director of Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School. During the interview, We discussed the work of Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, the most pressing issues facing communities of color, approaches to achieving community justice, and radical versus incremental change in social justice movements. Today, we welcome Dr. Harris. Okay, Um, so we're going to begin by having you just introduce yourself to our audience. Who are you? You know, what what work do you do? Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, my name is David Harris. I'm the actually the executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice here at Harvard Law School. Uh, the institute was founded 11 years ago by Charles Ogletree uh, to extend uh, uh, the work of Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, uh, kind of one of the most prominent uh, attorneys of the 20th. 20th century, and the architect of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Um, and in my capacity, I effectively guide the Institute in its programmatic activities and day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. And I, you know, my background, you know, I don't know if my background is in sociology. I, I, I have a, a degree in sociology. And that was actually one of the things that I wanted to touch on. You received your PhD in sociology from Harvard. And I was really interested in what made you choose uh, this particular path of um, focused on uh, community engagement, community justice, leadership in, in the community instead of like the traditional tenure track path. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I never really aspired to an academic career, so so that path was <laughs> that path was never really ahead of me. Um, okay. You know, my my graduate work, I pursued my graduate work largely kind of out of interest in the topics and interested in kind of thinking about and working on and understanding some things, which uh, then uh, helped prepare me for my future. Okay. Uh, okay. My my interests in, in civil rights and justice and racial equity uh, were kind of parallel to my academic interests, although I, I did some of that in, in my academic work. I, I also kind of worked my way through both undergrad and graduate school by working at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, uh, doing civil rights work. Um, and so I, I, I had these kind of two pieces of my, my personality and my career, this academic uh, piece and this uh, racial justice piece. Can I guess can you tell us a little bit more about your work with the uh, Office of Civil Rights and um, like what type of stuff did you do? Sure, sure. So, so when I was an under, I did my undergrad at Georgetown, and 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 uh, when I was in at Georgetown in D.C., I worked for the Commission on Civil Rights in Washington, uh, and and I worked in an office called the Office of of Research, and the work I did there was related to uh, thinking about uh, uh, racial identity and ethnic identity and how they affected people's lives. It's interesting because. Um, I'm going to kind of reveal my age. You know, I'm, I'm an old guy. Uh, so, so at the time, I mean, it's really interesting for me to look back because this we're talking about the mid to late '70s, and at that time, we we at the commission thought we, we were engaged in what we called second generation issues, right? So, <laughs> so we thought we were on the cusp of finishing, right? You know, we hit the second generation. You know, now we're in about the fifth generation. Um, but uh, so, so the work I did. And then that actually dovetailed with my work as an undergrad. I did my undergraduate thesis uh, on uh, black identity and voting behavior in uh, a presidential primary in D.C. And one of the things I wanted to look at and I tried to think about is uh, th th this idea that there's something called a black vote. And I, I kind of took umbrage at that phrase and the notion, uh, uh, you know, uh, to distinguish uh, from blacks, from votes cast by blacks to the role of one's identity as a black person affected how one voted. Mm. And, and I thought that was an important thing because one's ethnic identity as a, and in this particular election as an affluent uh, black uh, interface with your voting behavior differently from somebody who was impoverished. And I thought it was important to recognize that the black community and, and the black vote was not monolithic and that uh, the, the nature of one's identity actually had, had, had meaning and, and significance in the way one acted, in this case, the way one voted. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so, so then when I came to, to graduate school here, they, they, the commission opened a New England regional office, uh, and, and I went to work for that office. And, and in that capacity, my work was related to these things called state advisory committees. Every state has an advisory committee, and my work was designed to work with people in the New England states uh, who are on the advisory committee to kind of identify, investigate, explore, um, uh, civil rights issues in their states. And uh, you know, that experience was really critical and it's the beginning of some of my kind of really kind of community-based work and understanding that 
that issues are different and that you really need to kind of be attuned to what's going on in a particular place. Uh, and so, so, so I worked there throughout, uh, not throughout, but through a great deal of my graduate school career as well. Mm. Interesting. So, um, with, as you know, being a part of an executive director of the Charles Hamlin, Hamilton Institute, um, can you tell us a little bit more about this institute and some of the initiatives that you guys are spearheading? Uh, sure, sure. So, so as I mentioned, you know, it was founded by Professor Ogletree, uh, and you know, initially, uh, when it was founded, Professor Ogletree had four initiatives that he wanted to look at. One was uh, something he called the O'Connor Project, which is really looking at what was then known as the achievement gap, but we came to think of as the opportunity gap that that uh, defined the difference between uh, black children and children of color and white children. Uh, a second one was uh, the school to prison pipeline, which now is quite prominently known, but at the time it was actually uh, not as much attention given to it. The third was uh, uh, prison reentry, and again, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, over ten years ago, and, and at the time that was a rather uh, new on the horizon notion. And then uh, the question of race and the death penalty. Professor Ogletree had been interested in, in that topic and had just written a book on it. Uh, so, th so those are the four initiatives that, that he had when I came on. And, and we also uh, launched the 150th uh, anniversary of the Dred Scott decision. And, and as part of that, we, we took a look at the question of citizenship in this country 150 years after uh, it was determined that, uh, that, that, that black people could not and were not citizens. Uh, and we started to think about what constituted citizenship. And you know, we identified two real components that are really important, membership and participation in society. You know, not passports and voting and that kind of stuff, but the, the real core of membership has to do with the extent to which one uh, feels to be a member of society and, 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 and is thereby encouraged to and or allowed to participate. Uh, so, so those two, that, that, that piece kind of created a real anchor for, for the work that we, we have done since then. That's why I go into it. Um, and then what happened was that over the first few years, we were doing some kind of direct work on those four initiatives and came to understand that the issues we faced in all of those initiatives were actually fairly similar, you know, in, in kind of common parlance, you know, what we found was there were root causes for the problems that, that, that each one of those initiatives revealed and that it, you know, it didn't necessarily make sense to think of them as separate and individual initiatives, uh, but rather to start to think about the kind of system of inequality that underlay all those, uh, those four initiatives. Um, and, and then this, this came to kind of tie into something that Charles Hamilton Houston himself had said, which was you know, that all of our struggles must tie in together. So even as he thought that he had succeeded in addressing the question of uh, uh, school desegregation, he recognized that all the other dimensions of society continued to be haunted by these inequities. And we really had to, to, to work to, uh, uh, to make sure that they weren't done in isolation. And so, so we started to, to think about more, syst more systemic and comprehensive strategies uh, were necessary. Uh, and, and then a real turning point came, uh, you know, I was asked to give a talk at the Kirwan Institute, uh, to t and I was asked to give a talk about race, but a talk that didn't begin with blacks, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, okay. so, so I thought, oh boy, this is a challenge, you know, because that's how we always start, mm -hmm. right? You know, <laughs> that's how the world starts, race, black, right? Uh, and... Uh, and at the time, we had been doing work, a lot of work on the death penalty and a lot of work on uh, uh, there's there a, a new interest in, and concern about the incredible costs that the death penalty had, the kind of monetary cost, the amount of money we were spending to pursue the death penalty. And, uh, and, and you know, and I started to realize, I thought about, well, you know, what's the, the major, the kind of primary uh, determinant of whether we uh, have the death penalty? And it is, in fact, the race of victim. And, and you know, what I started to realize is that we had uh, a system of justice, the pinnacle of which was the death penalty, 
uh, which existed largely to vindicate the rights of, of a very small number of white folks, right? So, 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 so I, I started to think, I said, to, I, I raised this kind of rhetorical question, you know, kind of what kind of society are we that chooses to allocate our resources this way? You know, you know, and before we had Black Lives Matters, you know, to me, it was, a, it was, it, 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 it's a society in which white lives matter. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, and and so and I contrasted that I say, you know, uh, what kind of society are we that, that 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 allocates resources that way, even as it actively uh, underdevelops communities of color and underserves communities of color. Right. And underfunds communities mm -hmm. of color. So, you know, there are lots of answers to that. One answer is it's an unjust society. And that's a, that's the kind of that's there's there's no lie there. That's true. It is unjust. But the more critical question, more critical issue is that it's that we aren't deciding, right? <laughs> so, the, the, what yeah. kind of society are we? That 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 that's the big lie, right? Uh, and it, and it made me realize that, in point of fact, uh, our communities were not being heard in these policy decisions. Their voices were not being recognized in determining the allocation of resources. And that gave rise to this notion of what we call community justice. And so uh, th this idea that, that entire communities are being starved of resources while we expend huge amounts of money on a small number of white victims, who you know, which is not to take away from the tragedy of, uh, uh, of the losses of those families, but, uh, you know, it, it was really, it seemed to really crystallize uh, something about the way this country is structured uh, such that, it, that, that our communities are so underdeveloped. Uh, and so that, that really is at the root of, of, of the work we've been doing since then. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, you you mentioned for a second, like the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and I was actually wondering as someone who you've been doing this work for a very long time and you've worked with like greats who have like really helped to like change society for the better and especially for black people. And I was just wondering, did you have thoughts on like the current movement, like movement for black lives, black lives matter, and, like how we as this new generation, generation of um, scholars and activists and community organizers are going about the work? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I, as I said earlier, I'm an old man. Uh, I, 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 I actually, uh, to the extent that I allow myself to be optimistic, my optimism flows from the promise of the movement for black lives and the nature and direction and course and determination of today's generation of activists and young people. I mean, I find, uh, you know, one of the interesting things, uh, you know, I, I talk about is, uh, you, you know, and I don't, I don't buy the, the, the kind of, uh, a, a kind of binary between old civil rights and the movement for black lives. I don't think they're, they're, they're totally opposite, but, but I do think that one of the things that I really appreciate, admire, and, and, and want to protect is, uh, the the un you know it's not the unwillingness but the, the it is an unwillingness to kind of back down and 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 and, and take a, a a soft stance when in fact we we've done that for long enough and it's time to actually be much more assertive and much less accommodating and I, and I find th that the movement for Black Lives and other kind of youth oriented uh, 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 women led organizations have a different take on things and, and have, I hope, a greater capacity uh, to follow through. And, and, and from all appearances, from what I can see, that is happening. There are unbelievable, uh, not only uh, elements of activism, but uh, policy initiatives, analyses coming out uh, that I think uh, you know, we as a society really need and, and have to welcome and nourish and, uh, uh, and, and listen to. So I mean, it's, uh, I want to give an example. I'll give an example. Just one <laughs> example. You know, I was on a I was on a call the other day, yesterday. We're, we're doing a, we're trying to do some work here on on parole. Uh, in you know, and parole is one of those things that uh, uh, when, when we think about kind of uh, justice reform, people don't really think about parole. They think that we have a system of parole that works, you know, and it's a, and it's okay. Uh, so I was 
thing, you know, we're trying to plan a conference and there's some other kind of activist advocates, you know, my ilk uh, who are involved in this. And there was this kind of, oh, well, we have to make sure that we have some people on parole. Uh, you know, we have to focus it on them. And, and, and so we had, a, we had a call and we had a couple of people who had experience with parole on the call uh, who said, you know, listen, you know, we've been trying to get some, some of our, 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 our brothers and sisters involved and engaged, but they're concerned that their voices aren't really going to be heard. Right. Uh, and so, you know, my colleague says, well, you know, maybe what we should do is have a meeting and have people come together and give us their input. And then we'll make sure that it's included in the agenda for the conference, for the, uh, for the conference. And, you know, and the, the other person said respectfully, you know, that, that's fine. And, 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 you know, but but we need to we, we, I don't think we can really make this distinction between the planning and the event. And and, you know, what it came down to was this question of who's in charge. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so there was this sense that that the, the planners were different from the people who were affected. And uh, and. You know, I think there's this level we have to kind of be able to to, to be uncomfortable, right, mm -hmm. and, and push ourselves, you know, and that doing the kind of what we think of as community justice work really requires us uh, 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 to, 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 to be willing to step back, right? Mm -hmm. So people of my age and you know my experience, you know, I mean, I you know I want some respect, yeah, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> but. Uh, but but there's a, there's a need to, there's a, there's really a need to open up uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 and and allow all voices and experiences to be part of the planning and the implementation of what we're doing. Mm. Mm. That's interesting because um to kind of think about it from this way, even talking about this you know new generation and many of our listeners are probably within the millennial. Uh, you know, subset. And I'm thinking that, you know, social media is such an extreme presence in today's community. And I see that a lot of the time there's a big, especially when things happen, there's always a big mm -hmm. reaction and people are using hashtags mm -hmm. and using that way to either protest and resist. But then I'm also finding, especially even sometimes with my students, how can they get to that, you know, what's next right. phase or, or, or what's after just putting up this tweet or right. this Facebook status? How can I, right. um, you know, move on? And then also even kind of furthering that conversation a little bit, too, is this. I think sometimes it gets lost uh, in translation, but the type of change that is needed. Right. Most of the time we understand that the the radical change is some essence of what like when we talk about the criminal justice system and stuff, what needs to be done. But I think it's also missing the the steps. They're also missing the steps of the incremental change or the smaller steps that need to happen too. So I guess the first part of my question is really um, kind of what is your opinion with the social media age and, and how can people use that, but also move past that to actually see some action and also radical change versus incremental mm -hmm. change for in their communities. So the, no, these are great. These are, you don't have any kind of softball questions. Huh? You're not going <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like, like I, you know, I passed my oral exam and all that. <laughs> I know this is like an oral exam. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, um, uh, so, so right. So, the social media question is a critical one. Again, it's funny because you know, I, I had a meeting yesterday. We have a, 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 a couple of young people who are, are, are trying to help us work on on, on the social media presence and. Um, uh, you know, it's, I'll give you a, a kind of self-deprecating story. You know, I was I was on a call a few years ago, and uh, uh, I was talking about our work. And then somebody on the call says, "So, what are you doing? What are you doing social? What you know?" And uh, and, and, you know, and so I kind of started to give this sociological answer. I said, well, you know, we do, I started talking about sociology. You know, I didn't know what she meant, social media, you know what I'm saying? You know, so, so I've since learned uh, a, a little bit. Um, but uh, so I think in, in our call, in our conversation yesterday, one of the things, uh, as you say, uh, I, I think it's one thing to create a following. I mean, and kind of our project is designed very much on being able to spread word about things that work, about things people are doing in communities that are actually working to change the circumstances of the lives of the people in those communities. Um, and and so, it, and to do that, we need as broad an audience and participation as we can get. But 
But your question is the critical one, right? So the people who are advising us can talk about branding, and that's usually in terms of generating more dollars, more clicks, more this, more more something. Mm. Uh, and, and that's not what we want, right? We want a greater degree mm. of of activity, participation, um, and and the opportunity to act. So 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 we are in the process of trying to think that through and i do think that that's the that is the question of the 21st century how do we translate the the energy and the connectivity uh, into action for change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the ways that we're mm-hmm. thinking about doing this is that, that, that we have this idea, this project we're about to launch. Uh, I haven't thought of the name of it yet, but, but it's kind of a, an iPhone project. Right? I don't say an iPhone project. I'll say you know, a smartphone project. And you know, we've created a number of videos uh, of um, uh, uh, community-based organizations, what we call Justice Acts, uh, on, on phones. You know, we have a colleague who, and some interns this summer who, who did some work on iPhones. Uh, we're working with some, we have some people working with some students in Atlanta to create films on their iPhones uh, of uh, community-based efforts uh, that, that reflect community justice. So I think Mm-hmm. So, so I think, you know, that, you know, so, so what we're doing is saying, let's try to think about where people live. And we know that young people live on their phones, mm-hmm. right? So, so, so we want to encourage young people to use their phone to kind of get out into a community, uh, see who's doing what good stuff in their community, right? Whether it's a, mm-hmm. a large scale organization or, you know, a couple of people out of the church basement doing a project, you know, film that project, get to know those people, film that project, post that film. Uh, you know, kind of share that film with us so we can put it on our website so people in other parts of the country can see it. Uh, you know, so, so, so again, I think, you know, a, 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 a including kind of, you know, if you want to get involved, do A, B, and C, or let's all get together at this point, not, not, not to protest if we need to, but to, to do a little mini hackathon. Let's get together and figure out how, you know who's doing what to address trauma in the schools in our city. Let's sit down. To, let's 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 put out a call. Whether you know. So again, I you know I'm not real well versed in it, but I do think there's a, a place and a role for it that that we still have to collectively define. Um, on the incremental stuff, um, again, it's it's a tough one. Um, uh, you know because on some level. Uh, you know, the, the, the older I get, the less patient I become, right? And <laughs> and the, 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 the less inclined I am, if given the choice, to go for the incremental over the radical, right? I, I, I mm. understand that both have their place. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I'll give you another example. Uh, uh, so, so in the justice reform world, there, 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 are, there, there are these notions of abolitionism. You, are you familiar with that? Right, like, like mm-hmm. pr- prison yes. abolition, abolishing the police. Right, right. These are these mm-hmm. are radical ideas to some people, but I have to remind people that you know prison and police are not part of our human nature. I mean, they they haven't always been part of society. It's not like you know it defines people but the but the idea seems so radical right how can you have a world without police yeah. and without prisons are you crazy right well no uh, no we're not crazy we, we we need to think this through now right are we going to abolish prisons and police in, in the next one two three five ten years no uh but if that if you if you're willing to entertain the notion that that is within the realm of possibility, I think it changes your incremental, your approach to, to what you do, right? If that's your, if that's your goal, you start to define the things you're willing to accept differently, right? Uh, mm. You know, you say, you know, you, you know, we, and, and it, so we had an example here a few years ago, there was a, a movement, so there was a, 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 a guy, there was a murder that was, that was committed by somebody who was out on parole, right? And um, um, it led to, a, 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 and who had been arrested for uh, th- three times. And so, so there was, while well, the rest of the country was moving away from three strikes legislation in Massachusetts, liberal Massachusetts, we started to entertain the thought of, 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 uh, of expanding three, uh, creating a three strike law, right? Three, you know, mm-hmm. kind of so that three strikes and you hit this, ma- this mandatory minimum. Now, as part of that legislation, 
which was opposed by every black elected legislator in the, in the, in the legislature. The problem is there were only 12 of them, right? But, but, mm. but, but, but as part of that, there were some small changes in some of the mandatory minimum sentencing provisions here. And some of my colleagues, see people I like, respect, were really pleased because they got some of what they wanted, right? But in the meantime, mm-hmm. in the meantime, we took a huge step backwards in all other ways, right? And, you know, that's a really hard thing to think about, you know, if, if, you know, if you're advocating for the people who got some benefit out of the change in the mandatory minimums. But the net result was that was our shot at, at justice reform and, and we didn't push hard enough for the more radical approach. Um, mm. So, so again, I mean, I think some of it, you know, that's a rambling answer, but I think, you know, some, no, some of it is, you know, is situational. So, so I, I, I'm not yeah. one who's, who's going to say in every instance, the radical over uh, the incremental, right? And, and or, or who mm-hmm. will say that they are, they are at odds by definition, but it, it, it's mm-hmm. situational and you have to really think about and understand what the trade-off is of each one, because the, the tendency is to think that, that you go with the incremental because going with the radical, you'll never get it, and the cost is too high. But if the cost is is pushing the envelope to what's possible, you know, then 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 the incremental thing is a little bit further out. Yeah. You follow? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. uh, and that stuff has to be in community and in conversation, and that's the point. It has to be in conversation with all those voices. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and we all have to be, un- you know, we've made a little uncomfortable in how we move forward. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Sure. Um, you kind of, so like thinking about like the vision, like for the, f- like what we can envision and like what we ultimately can achieve. You, you mentioned earlier community justice and it's kind of like, what does that look like and how do we achieve it? <laughs> like what, what does it mm-hmm, look like? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So and that's an interesting question because, you know, it, maybe it's a hallucination for me, but I do have a picture of it. Um, and, you know, pa- 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 what, it, what it looks like, to tell you the truth, is, uh, is a, a, a society in which, uh, so for instance, another example, right? Uh, forgive me for just, but, but uh, you know, so, so there's a tendency in our society. We, we recognize these gaps in opportunity, right? We, we recognize here in Boston, for instance, uh, the, the net worth of a, of, a, of, a, of a black person is eight dollars, right? The net worth the net worth of a white person is two hundred and forty seven thousand dollars, right? Now, now get that, get that, right? Yeah. Eight dollars versus yeah. two hundred forty seven thousand dollars. It's just it's just mind boggling every time I say it, right? So 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 so. So, so the question is, there's, there are lots of things that talk about kind of, there's this new language of, of opportunity, areas of opportunity, and we need to open up areas of opportunity to people from the cities, which means open up white neighborhoods to black people or to people of color, right? And so, so the, the thought is, what we need to do is kind of create some housing lotteries, right, that, that let a few people go from the city to the suburb, maybe creates some more, what, we have this METCO program here, creates some more seats for students from the city and suburban schools, you know, and so that's public policy by lottery, right, that's what it is, that, that replaces the luck uh, uh, of where you happen to be born, the luck of a zip code with the luck of the draw. That's not public policy. To me, community justice is nothing less than changing the way public policy is created such that every community offers the opportunity uh, for full membership and participation in society by all of its residents and that you don't have to go, you don't Mm -hmm. have to go somewhere else. Right. Uh, And and that that our that our resources. uh, So you don't redistribute people, you redistribute opportunity. Right. So community justice means that those communities that have not been served, that have been underserved, are served and that they're done and that it happens. And the critical point is that it happens taking advantage of the knowledge, wisdom, experience and expertise of the people in those communities to define the programs, policies and practices that will move that community forward. And so that 
so so that you start so that community justice looks like giving voice, inclusion, participation, and power, and that results in opportunity and equality. Mm, okay, I have um, just just a couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll we'll finish up. One question I've been burning to ask you, and when I was looking at some of the things on um, the website of, of Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, um, is you know, I've seen that you guys are really have approached some of the things, especially dealing with the criminal justice system and what has happened with the war on drugs in the past um, and different changes in law, uh, marijuana prosecution and then, uh, of course, the crack cocaine discrepancy and things of that nature. And currently what we've been seeing is this a lot of rhetoric and push for addiction, <laughs> but specifically with heroin. And I find it, um, you know, somewhat interesting how, you know, this conversation mm-hmm. is being pushed where they're trying to uh, essentially be softer on uh, their approach to uh, prosecuting or, or you know, getting mm-hmm. kids using heroin or whoever's. And it wasn't that same kind of rhetoric when it was crack in the inner cities. And um, I'm wondering if, if, you know, if you've noticed that or if others have noticed that if there's conversation going on against that approach, because on one hand, it is something I think most agree with. But on the other hand, uh, because I feel like they're really being specific on the drug of choice of what they're trying to treat and be less punitive on. I feel like that also has some kind of hidden uh, ramifications mm-hmm. as well. So, so, so yeah, I'm just yeah, interested so, on your so thoughts listen, on that. Don't yeah. get me started, but I already, I already <laughs> gave you my answer earlier when, when I said what? I said uh-huh. what? I said white lives matter, <laughs> right? So, so case, I mean, mm-hmm. enough said, right? So, but, the, but, you know, it's not <laughs> enough said. I, I, so listen, and let's, let's remember some things about drug policy in this country. When heroin was largely a problem of black people, right? And, and there was a time, mm-hmm. right? You know, there was either neglect or punishment, right? Right? Mm. So now, now, so man, you know, really, really man, so you, get, <laughs> it makes, you know, it makes my blood boil because now we hear all these stories about these these wonderful suburban grandmothers who are taking care of their addicted daughters' kids, right? And and isn't that wonderful? But you know, back in the day, they were all crack mothers, right? We, you know, so so just the language, you know, I mean, the part of it is just the, the contrast in the language is brutal. It, you know, it, 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 it's mm-hmm. brutally revealing. And again, man, man yeah. the, the, I'm not saying, you know, the, the number of people dying uh, today is, is, is horrifying. Right. And, and, and I don't mm-hmm. want to minimize that. But but I, but as you note, my the point is that the reason we have that 247,000 to eight, the reason that we have entire communities that are really kind of have limited certain kinds of opportunities is because of the drug, po- the different drug policies that were implemented, the war on crime, the war on drugs that really actively impose control and underdevelopment on communities and have, have resulted in this. And so if your public policy, if you're going to be able to adopt the public health policy toward addiction services for current opioid abusers, you need to understand a public health framework for resolving the problems that we have in our cities, right? And that public health framework mm-hmm. means you've got to look at the whole spectrum of, 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 of kind of the, the, the causes and social determinants of health. And, and start to implement policies that address those social determinants such that those communities are healthier. Now, one, you, you use the phrase, I, I, could not, I could not speak publicly without getting this in, All right? If you look on our website, mm-hmm. you will see that there are eight categories of, uh, of, of activity that we, that we highlight. You will, you will know nowhere does it say criminal justice. Mm-hmm. I hate the phrase. Okay, so on our website, we Makes call sense. it safety and healing, right? Because, because, that, okay, yeah. because criminal justice, I, I'm, I'm going to so this gets into a whole realm of bias and, and associations and all that kind of stuff. But criminal justice says to many people, black people, right? It says mm. criminal, criminality and race are intertwined in this country. And we need to break that connection, right? We need to stop talking about criminal justice and we need to call for justice. And I say community justice, but we need to distinguish and, 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 and just stop talking about criminal justice because, the, because, mm. because we don't get past criminality then. And we don't start to recognize and understand that the issues we're talking about are much bigger than, than the punitive system that we use. 
So, mm-hmm. No. Um, I agree. I actually um, I was a teaching fellow for a restorative justice class and like thinking about like how we can move beyond, you know, certain terminology and like move toward like healing and community and, mm-hmm. and being mm-hmm. whole. So, yeah, I completely mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. agree with that. Um, you mentioned. So, and I think if you ask, you ask people, if you ask our people in in, in our communities, you know, they, they are interested in safety and healing, you know. But they, they, you know, they, you know, this criminal, so called criminal justice system, you know, has not has not done right by us, mm-hmm. right? So, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're going to say something. Oh no 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 no. Uh-huh. Um, it was on a well, it was a pivot. So I'm happy you got that okay. in. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, like the initiatives that you have on the website and how you you that Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, they are doing very or you're doing very specific and concrete things to bring about change. And so that's what, we, you know, we want to hear a little bit more about, like telling our audience, like, what are some steps? What are some specific steps we can take? Like, how can we be more like the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute in terms of like identifying issues and creating strategies of action. Mm-hmm. So uh, again, I mean, our, you know, so, uh, you know, we, we do a lot with mirrors. There are just there are very few of us, you know, we, we're not a big, huge institution. You don't have a lot of people, you know, the, if you, I, I urge people to go to the website, to, to visit the website, charleshamiltonhouston.org or houstonmarshallplan.org, uh, you know, and, and our project really lives on that website. And, uh, you know, our, our thinking and hope is that, what we want to do is populate that website with information about community justice activities across those eight topics you'll see at the top, you know, kind of safety and healing, education, transportation, infrastructure, economic stability, you know, I'm missing some, I can't remember. Um, and, and we want to be able to have, uh, to, to, to be able to, to, to post, publish, publicize and highlight local action, local research, local resources, and local activities that, 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 that address those issues in various cities, right? And so part of what, you know, our, our, you know we, we hope to kind of, uh, kind of be in different cities and help do that. I think there are lots of ways for people to do that. There are, there are these little, you can do hackathons, you can get involved. And again, you know, p- part of Part of part of our so I, you know I don't know who your audience is exactly but but I think the critical the, the critical thing is to identify the voices of the people who are making changes in their communities highlight those voices participate in that activity contribute to that uh, and 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 then probably just as important. Try to make sure that those uh, organizations and, and individuals have the resources they need to do the work they're doing, because a lot of a lot of this has to do with changing the way we think about allocating resources, right? And 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 who is worthy, right? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. kind of, uh, yeah. and, and and what works, right? So so and, and and basically being open to rethinking things like what works, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 to you know not not using necessarily uh, the kind of uh, evaluation metrics we often think of, but think of kind of whether uh, you know whether a particular activity uh, gets young people more or less engaged in their community activities, or uh, recognizes you know more or less uh, what their talents are. Um, so I you know and, I, and and again I want to come back and emphasize that I. The critical thing is that the determination of priorities has to be local, right? Mm-hmm. That, that nobody mm-hmm. comes in from outside, whether from a university or outside completely, and tells people in a community, this is what you need to do. Mm-hmm. But you need to, be able to, you, you need to mm-hmm. be able to facilitate the conversation for people themselves to determine what they feel they need to do and then put yourself at service of that. Mm-hmm. I'm in complete agreement. Well, uh, David, we want to say thank you. This has been very informative. Uh, we know you have to, to go, but we definitely appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. And I know our listeners are greatly appreciated, too. And we appreciate the work that you're doing for the community and for the people. 
Um, uh, for our listeners, we'll definitely put the information uh, of, of of the website on our on our on our website at the resources page, so you always find it there. And then follow us, of course, on Twitter and Instagram. And we'll definitely want to keep this conversation going with our forums, etc. And any questions that you may have, we'll try to answer uh, following up this conversation and this interview with with David Harris as well. Um, is there anything you want to say in closing? No, no, I just thank you for the opportunity. I, I appreciate this. I, I commend you for doing this and, and your listeners for uh, kind of getting and staying involved. Thank you. Most definitely. Okay, all right. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, Des, what you think about Dr. Harris? Well, you know, considering the fact that I'm going to be on the job market in the year, he actually had me thinking about whether I wanted to do something like him, like take his path instead of going into academia, you know, Mm -hmm. being the director of like a community based center where I can use my skills and expertise that I've gained in this Mm -hmm. Ph.D. program Mm -hmm. to have a more direct impact on the community. So I, I think it's this was different because we often interview you know, PhDs, professors, um, but this is like one of the first time we've interviewed someone with a PhD who was like, nah, I was never going the professor route. <laughs> yeah, he did say that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, that wasn't my intention, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's un- not as common, you know, when you're getting a PhD, because most of everything is pushes us towards academia and being a professor. So, so he went against the grain a little bit, but is doing some really, really good great work for the communities mm-hmm. and then some people do it the other way too is like you'll go the professor route and you'll get well known and prestige and then you'll start your own institute or center on a campus and to be the director that that way too later on in your career but not in the beginning mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. what real money is too uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I, w- I wanted to ask you about the interview since you are a criminologist you focus on and you know we've had so many interviews and we use the term criminal justice and so hearing him saying that you know he doesn't like the term because when we use that term we can't move past criminology I mean criminality mm-hmm. I wanted to just get your thoughts on that what did you think about that yeah I think um I see where he's coming from uh, I just think from a, mm, just thinking from like the public's perspective, when you hear criminal justice, I think some, there are certain things with some key words where people are just automatically going to go in one direction and it's going to be hard to see, get them to see the bigger picture. So criminal justice does in, in, entail a lot of different dimensions and, and aspects, but I think large in part what he was saying is that when we say criminal justice or any kind of reform. I think many, most people are just looking at the criminal element and are like, uh, let's, oh, that's, we're going to, we're going to let these bad guys free and we're going to punish people anymore. And that's what we're trying to change. And it really, really kind of narrows the conversation. And so you know, there may be some, some um, benefit to tweaking the language a little bit and not, and taking the word crime or criminality out of it so we can have just get people, more people onto the table to listen to the broader discussion of what we're actually trying to reform instead of them just automatically running to, we're trying to let all the bad guys out or whatever, um, which is much more, much more than that from this interview, what we learned from this interview and other interviews too, that uh, there's a big, big system and web that's you know interwoven around all this community and aspects of the criminal justice system. Um, so that was a good take though. One of the first times I've, I've heard somebody say it that way too. And, and bring it up. Maybe that's your next theory paper, Todd. <laughs> maybe maybe you should hit up uh, Dr. Harris and be like, let's 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 publish let's some, publish some. <laughs> with this. And I think this is why, yeah. Like, yeah, a lot of people are using the term more so community justice, uh, um, because it's taking it's it's in, it's incorporating some of the things with like criminal justice elements and and trying to uh, detangle that and and poli- and have policy, you know, make things easier for people getting out of prison, whatever it is. Uh, but it's, when you use the word community, I think people are oh, a little bit more likely to listen. And it's a little softer, I mm-hmm. guess. So. Speaking of community justice, we really need to move toward that. I know so many people who are tired of having outsiders coming in to tell them what they need. No, how about you sit down and listen to mm-hmm. me? Or change because I know what my community needs. You know, maybe I don't have, you know, a fancy degree or I might not use the same terminology that you use, but 
I can I can explain it front to back what's happening here and what needs to happen to change. And so I think people with fancy titles or with a lot of money, they really take for granted that the people that they are trying to help might have more knowledge than them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's the key to anything. You know, I think a lot of times, uh, sometimes people can have, you know, I know there's research on this, right? Uh, maybe in the social work field, but I'm sure in other fields, we have like what they call like the savior mentality or perspective mm-hmm. where you just feel like you're going in and you're rescuing all these people and you're being the hero. Um, and all these people are just desperate and can't help themselves. And here you come swooping in with your cape and save the day. Uh, and that's not, that's not how it actually works. That's not how true change is going to happen. You just have to go in, you have to talk to them, one, get their perspective of what the problems are, and then they will also tell you what they need to fix it. Um, mm-hmm. And then you use your expertise to put those things in place, all right? Uh, and that's like anything, right? Like with the, with the doctor, the doctor, you can't just go to the doctor that's going to look at you and automatically give you the medicine you need. You need to be like, nah, doc, this hurts when I do this, and this hurts when I move this way. And the more information you give, the more they can help you. But you need you need that person's perspective. You need their yeah. you need them to tell you what's going on and before you can do any kind of help. And so that's that's a good point of community justice. It starts from within, within the community before before those coming from outside of it. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Um, But overall, just, you know, it was a really good interview. Um, I really appreciated the quote and I'll I'll probably start using this, that when it comes to like community justice and it comes to trying to improve things, we need to move beyond redistributing people Mm -hmm. and actually redistribute opportunities. Mm -hmm. So stop shuffling people around thinking that that's going to solve anything until we redistribute opportunities, redistribute some wealth. We, we're not really going to see the effects um, mm. of these um, programs that we want to see. Very true. Very true. A good takeaway message. And for all of you listeners, um, definitely check out, you can go on to the Charles Hamilton Houston website and check out Institute of what they're doing uh, and stay abreast. They always constantly post uh, new articles and you know current events and things they're doing for the communities, ideas they're having, research, whatever it is, it'll be a good resource for you all and, and maybe take some of those ideas back to your own communities and start trying to get some things done as well. So so good stuff. So pay attention to that. But as always, continue to um, follow us on inst- uh, social social media or Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at BHD Podcast. Email us black and highly dangerous um, a BHD podcast at gmail.com. You can go to our website at black and highly dangerous.com um, and continue to rate us and review us on iTunes and all that good stuff. Rate us, review us, share us with your friends, share us with your family, share us with your enemies, as we always say. And as always continue to be the oppressors worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.